So, <clears throat> yes, uh, just to reiterate, reiterate what uh, Lane said, today is going to be ultimately about visual management and how to be transparent and understand the flow of work. But to get to that, I'd like to talk about uh, some lean principles, uh, talk about the, the notion of Kanban. A few teams in the last week have been asking me how to set up a Kanban system. So we can learn about that today and I'll give you a bit of a history lesson of how it was developed for Toyota and in manufacturing. Um, but before all of that, you see a table here and we're going to have a little bit of a game. I have a story for you. Um, Casino Canberra. Has anyone here been to Casino Canberra? No, we're not. Yeah. Right, so um, they've been on the phone to OBS. They need, uh, need our help. This story works so much better when I work in banks. Um, they've uh, got a plane load of people coming into Canberra uh, later today, and they all want to dive down to the casino, and they're going to be loading up the pokies. The thing about um, the guests is they're superstitious. What they believe is the coin, by the way, these are New Zealand coins, so I'll, I'll know if you take any. Um, they believe that if, with one hand, if you flip the coin four times, like that, it's good luck and gives good fortune when you put them in the pokey. And so there's hundreds of people coming down and they want us to do bags and bags of these, flipping them four times. So who wants to help me with this? Firstly, we need four workers. One, two, three, four. Okay, four workers, if you can sit around the table, thank you. Now, of course, the money is involved, and like I say, you can't be trusted with money. So each worker, I'm going to need a supervisor. So can I have four supervisors, please? One, two, three. Bring your iPhone as well. You'll need to time your workers. So uh, now, workers, you've all got KPIs, and uh, don't be the slowest. In fact, I may fire the slowest person and bring in another worker. So, what I'd like you to do is stand behind your worker. And <coughs> we're all good to go? You'll, you've got a timer? Some, yep. So, we want to know how long it takes to uh, do all of these four, um, these, these coins four times. So, what, what I've got here, John, we've got a bunch of 20 coins, and you're going to flip them with one hand, each coin, like that. And we'll time how long it takes you to do it. Daniel, when, when all 20 have been done, then I'd like you to uh, flip with one hand all the way across the lane and then so on all the way around. Now what we need is a branch manager, don't we? Can I have a branch manager? Casey. <laughs> Casey, bring your phone up. Uh, now, now, branch managers. It's okay. Yeah, it's okay. No, no, that's okay. Yeah. We have a timer here. We have a timer. So the branch manager, what I'd like to know is... Um, I'm going to be making notes on the top here. It's not going to be too hard. No, it's fine. All you need to do is time. Right, so what we're going to do is know the total time. So I'd like to know when all 20 coins have gone around all four people. So each person flips the coin once, and the good fortune happens when all four coins have been flipped. Okay? Now, we need a CEO. Who's a CEO? Who's the manager here? Matthew, there you go. Right, CEO, take a mate. No, enjoy, your, enjoy your curry, mate, uh, because you're the CEO, you're on Fiji or something. Uh, we, we don't need you at the moment, but we'll, we'll need you later on. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and finally, we need a planner. Do we have any analysts or planners in here? You're an analyst, brilliant. Come up here, we're going to need your help for this one. So, uh, obviously... We have to do the planning before we start, so I need you to help me with this now. 20 coins flipped four times with one hand, around four people. How, how long do you reckon it'll take? Four people, 20 coins. No, 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 no. Hands off, you're the branch manager. Right, so 20 coins flipped one person to the next and to the next and to the next. So all 20 coins four times around. How long do you reckon it'll take? Chanel to four minutes. Oh, I'm, I'm interested. Sh show me you're working. <laughs> Just a gut feel. Okay, that's fine. That's, so let me put four minutes here. There you go, it's four minutes up there. Cool. You all good to give it a go? All the timers ready? Okay, and 
And so you're measuring when all 20 get to the end. Okay, and go. Don't forget, don't be last. You've been watched. Oh. <laughs> 20, well done mate, and then over to Saddam, uh, just hold, hold the phone for the numbers at the moment, and um, your worker, yep, yeah. oh, Dan's a bit keen now, Dan. <laughs> Eat one and flip one. Yeah. Right, next. So, uh, so to uh, actively manage your workers because if your workers fail, it's, it's part of your management technique as well. <laughs> no pressure, mate. Don't be last, though. Don't be the slowest. Yeah. Cool. Oh, look at that. Oh, she's nailed it. Cool, well done. Right, okay, so worker number one, how long did it take? Uh, you sure? No. It's usually about 20. Yeah. Sounds like 21, not 12, but anyway, uh, I'll, I'll put 12 down for the 12 <laughs> minutes, yeah. Okay, how long, how do, how long did Dan take? Uh, 23. 23? Nearly 22. Well, we'll call it 23. Lane? <laughs> 24? Oh, mate. 19. Nine, so we'll call that 19. Well done. So no pressure in the next round, John. You're the rock star with this one. So just before we go, uh, oh yeah, so the total time was... I would take one second off that. All right, 1 minute 45. No, no, because that will still be the same, uh, because that was the start to end. So 1 minute 40, what happened, estimator? The, 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 it was just a wild guess, wasn't it? Yeah. That's okay. That's fine. Uh, let's see if we can do it again. Uh, take it, put the coins back with John. Uh, there's another bunch there. So. This time, John, we're going to do two batches of ten. So I split them into ten. Now what's going to happen here is the supervisors, you're going to time your worker still from the first to the twentieth coin. But when you finish the 10, John, you can pass them to Dan and you can start as soon as you get the 10. And Lane, you can start as soon as you get the first 10. The timer, I'd like, to, I'd like you to time when all 20 have been flipped four times still. Uh, CEO, come on up. How was Fiji, mate? <laughs> Got a great team. Got a great time. Right, so, so CEO. Uh, you're interested in another number. You want to know when the first 10 have been flipped four times. So you've got your phone in your pocket there. So I'd like you to time from when the first coin is uh, flipped by John all the way to when Fern flips the 10th coin. So when the first batch of 10 gets all the way around. And we'll just see how long that takes. Obviously in the first go we had, we had 20 coins and the first batch was the same as the total batch. But now we're going to look at total for you, Katie and you're going to look at just the first batch of 10. Uh, so me, Gareth, are there only two batches of 10, each person? Yes, yes. yes. there's still 20 coins, but it's two batches of 10. Planner, how long do you reckon it'll take? So it's 40, one, 1 minute 45 for 20 last time, and now we're doing 20 but in two batches of 10. One uh, that would be 57 seconds. It's up to you. Yeah. A minute and five. Okay. 105, we'll put in the estimate. 1.05. Cool. Do 105? That's the whole 20. Yeah. Yeah. 
Okay, are you good to start? And start. There's a 10. And then the second 10. Oh, mate, what's going on? It's even slower. Come on, come on, come on. We've got, we've got to do thousands of these. Can't hang around. So did you get the first 10 then? Yep. Yeah. yeah. That's okay. Oh, wow. Get a load of that. Okay, worker number one. 22 seconds. Oh, you're a bit slow, mate. I think you were 20 last time. So. 22. Worker number two. 28. Yeah. He's pretty slow. Dude. 28. So we're getting slower, right? 23. 23. Oh, a little bit faster. And 21. 21. You're still slower. Oh, yeah. So, Lane. Paul, oh, yeah. So, so who, who are going to blame for that one? Because it's going to be slower. What was the slowest? 102. So, uh, well, hold on a minute. It doesn't work. Yeah, because everyone was slower, but the overall time's faster. How can that work? Let's hold the phone on that for a moment. I'm, I'm being theatrical. <laughs> no, no. One by two. Now, the first batch, what did the first batch come in on? Well, I only did the first batch for, um, for John. I didn't do it for that whole time. Ah, yeah. No, it was, it was 56. About 56 seconds, yeah. Cheers. So, so when it's, it's when the first batch gets all the way around. Right. So, the first batch was 56, a little bit faster than the whole thing. Now let's try it with the next batch, John. Uh, and we're going to do four batches of five. So it's still 20 coins, but what happens is the supervisor's still timing your worker for the whole 20. Mm. Um, the, as soon as the first five go to the next worker, you start. And you should be, your wrist should be in it, right? So you can get faster. Well, I expect an improvement. Your, your bonus depends on it. And I'm measuring you individually, not the whole outcome. So, uh, planner, before we go, what do you reckon? So, four batches of five. Yeah, but it's a problem. Yeah? Then we have to time. They're going to lose time. Yeah, okay, so what do you reckon? One and ten. Okay. One. There you go. No, the supervisors shouldn't be doing the shifting. You're not allowed to touch the coins. The, the, the unions will be on to you, mate. <laughs> you want to do work? Yeah. <laughs> right, so, um, so only the workers can move the coins. It's up to the workers who move the, who move the coins. So do you reckon it'll still be 110, Rob? They collaborate. Yeah. What, what do you think? Oh, don't ask the workers. They're, they're here to work. No, no. Right. Are you ready to go? And... Oh. oh, estimate, yeah, yeah. So we've got the estimate, which is 110, you say? 110. There you go. I do get excited, don't I? Um, are you ready to go? And go. Go. Come on, come on, come on, come on. We're ready to ship, ready to ship. We're just waiting for you, Fern. Why are you holding us up? What's going on? Yay. Well done. 
Okay, record number one. How long? Class so you... there, mate. You don't take your job seriously, do you? Number two? 27. 27. Good as we get to begin with. <laughs> yeah, okay, we can keep you. Number three? 25. 25. Oh. Right, what's going on? My, my office after this. <laughs> you, we need to talk. <laughs> we, we need a difficult conversation coming up. Fern? 24. 24. What's going on? You had a cold. You had a cold, right, so it's illness. We'll put this down to illness. So, yeah. we thought 110, didn't we? Yeah. Well, I did prove you wrong. Well, let's have a look. 44 seconds. Wow. 44. Yeah, good team. 44 seconds. How about the first batch? The first five was 25. 25 seconds. Wow. Cool. Now, the last go, and then you can all sit down and we'll talk about what we found out. This is a batch of one. So you flip a coin, and as soon as you see a coin, you can flip a coin. And it, this is always turns into carnage with coins flying <laughs> everywhere. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Eye masks. Yes. Yeah, health and safety. Uh, planner. What do you reckon? A batch of one. So it's all twenty blasting on three. What do you reckon? A minute. Okay. Well, you think it still will be a bit slower than that forty-four? Because maybe it's like a there's a, a sweet spot, yeah. Around the five, is that what you're saying? I'm thinking, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm still wondering about the passing through. Mm -hmm. Because it's not optimal. No, it's inefficient, isn't it? And each person is getting slower. So if you have a one piece, it's going to be less efficient. We, we need to be efficient, right? So yeah. it's if, so. And they need to keep track of where they are and what they're doing what they have in total. Yeah. So what do you reckon? About a minute? A bit more? Think about, you know, they might drop a few coins as well, so... Yeah, put, yeah, no. Mm. 55, okay, 55 it is. I'll, I'll, we'll settle on 55. You reckon it'll be closer to 30? Okay. But the planner says 55, so... Um, usually the planner gives you a time that's under what you want to do. <laughs> um, yeah, well, I, yeah, it gives you some buffer there, right? It's a stretch Are we all good to go? Oh, uh, before we start, uh, the first batch, right, a bit of a spoiler alert, it's about three seconds, so be quick. <laughs> okay, ready to go? And go. Well done. Round of applause for our workers. Okay, so, worker number one, how long? 19. 19, there you go, rock and roll. Number two? 25. <laughs> There's always one, isn't there? Uh, number three? 26. And uh, number four? 25, so yeah, 19 was really fast at the beginning. Yeah, there we go. Uh, 29 for the total time. 29, so you just said 30. Yeah, yeah well, it will, we'll call it 30, there you go. I'll do, do it properly. Um, so 30. And the first batch was? 2.6. There you go, 2.6. Ah, oh, I love that. Happy days. Right, so uh, thank you very much for all the workers, managers, supervisors, and the CEO. You're still here? Yeah. Um, take a seat and let's talk through what we saw here. Um, so, for the benefit of the people who are watching remotely, I'm going to ask the people in the room uh, to, I'll have a bit of a conversation with the people in the room. I realise that the microphones won't pick up what you say. So it's going to sound really weird to the people in this room because I'm going to repeat what you said. So, uh, okay, thanks. So what, what patterns can we see here? What strikes you?
deeply. Uh, okay, so uh, say again. <laughs> <laughs> By simplifying the individual operations and passing them on as soon as they're completed. Ah, yeah. yeah. Integer operations, passing them on as soon as they're completed. Not many factory workers would say that. Um, Casey, yeah, what I'm do using you the microphone. Um, the estimation improved. The estimation did improve. I, I love this, by the way. Um, who was the planner? Right. What I normally do with this, I really play it up and I say, and usually sometimes people will say, Oh, right, so 20 coins, let's say a second a coin and then half a second to pass multiplied by four people. Let's add 15% to that, but then take away. And sometimes I, I try and get people to spend more than 1 minute 45 planning it. And the best way to find out how long it takes is to do it. Because as soon as you got that number, you were quite close, actually, most times. Uh, what else? Anyone Gareth. else got any ideas? Any, uh, any views? Gareth, um, sorry, just uh, for those people that are listening online, if they could Skype questions to me, so that's John Connolly. I yeah. suppose that's something we just haven't covered. Of course, yeah, so Skype Thanks. John Connolly, and he can, if you've got any questions at the end, or if you've got any comments, John will uh, put his hand up. So, uh, Fern. Yeah, um, for the most part, even though the overall time got shorter, um, people's individual times slowed down slightly. Yeah. Each iteration. Now, of course, I was winding you all up saying, you know, you're not doing really well. But isn't this interesting? Each individual worker appeared to be less efficient. And management theory for the last 150 years has focused on efficiency and less about activation. And what we're really interested in, we shouldn't be interested in how each individual worker is efficiently working. It's this number here, right? And as you say, you change the way you flow the work and it gets significantly better. How about this column here, the F column? What does this tell us? It's about first realizing value effect where the first batch got through faster yep. each time. So you got the value earlier on in the process. Yeah, so it could stand for first, it could also stand for feedback. In the first case, you send the whole delivery to the customer, and if there's anything wrong with it, if there's any defects or it wasn't what the customer wanted, then you've wasted all of that effort, and you have to rework all of that effort. In this case, in the other extreme, in this, this is called one piece, by the way, one piece manufacture. In this case, after 2.6 seconds, if the customer says, that's not what I wanted, it's not so bad, because we've lost this coin and four coins here, so we've lost five coins. Whereas in this case, we could potentially have 100 coins in the system, the 20 that you've just delivered, and then 80 in process. So the work in progress is much higher. And again, traditional management theory in manufacturing used to think of work in progress as an asset. We've spent money on it, we've added value to it, thus we can put it on the asset list. But Toyota said, nah, if you've added value to something and you can't sell it, it's a liability. And Toyota was different to all of the car manufacturers 50 years ago by that accounting system. So what they try and do is reduce the work in progress. Anything else, John? Uh, there's a question from Skype, um, uh, a suggestion on about how the process could be made better. Yep. So the suggestion is to pile them up into a column, flip it over, pass it on to the next person, still as a column, then flip and pass, etc. the whole thing done in 10 seconds max. Yeah, or get them um, to use both hands. Yeah, so um, obviously if this was my day job flipping coins, I'd just, well, I don't know what minimum wage here is in, in Australia, but it'd be cheaper to get a machine to do it, right? So, um, and sometimes people do that in game system. What I'm trying to express here is the, the notion of batch sizing the work as small as possible. And, the, and I'll, I'll go into why we do this now. The idea is you limit the work in progress, so you've got less money tied up in the system, if you have any defects, you find them sooner. You get the fast feedback. The customer gets delivery sooner, so you can realize the value sooner. And we focus on flow, and we focus on the end-to-end -end system. Now think about the way we're measured as contributors, as, as, as workers. We're measured by KPIs on our own performance. And what can happen is your KPI is at odds with the whole team's KPI. And the, cu the customer doesn't care that everyone was working really hard. What they care about is that they get their delivery sooner. And so again, that's, this is something that we've got to think about. And when you move over to an agile style of working, 
it, it pushes the, the boundaries of how our HR system works. It's a real challenge, uh, Lane, and uh, I know no organization that's really well nailed it at the moment. And this is a challenge because we want to work on how the team is performing rather than each individual member within the team. Was that good fun? For those of you who are going to be Scrum Masters, I suggest this is going to be recorded. Watch it again. Share it with your team. Have the game and talk to the team about lean principles. And Google lean principles. There's loads of them. And they feed into what Agile is about. So Agile um, came after lean, and it uses all of the ideas of lean and then adds things about individuals and interactions and customer collaboration. Okay, so the next slide I have, I will talk about Kanban and lean manufacturing. Uh, so where's my gallery? Safe painting. Where is it? Where is it? Here. So a uh, story about myself. Uh, my background was as an engineer. I worked as a production engineer in electronics manufacturing and spent some time at Sony in Japan and also in China making headphones. And we've been using Kanban for many years in, in, in industry and in, in, um, in manufacturing. So what does Kanban mean? It literally means card system or billboard. And it goes back to the Middle Ages in Japan where you'd go to the spa baths and it was the end of the working day and 200 people would descend on the, on the baths and it wasn't much fun. So what they decided to do was get 20 tokens, 20 cards on the outside of the spa. When you walked up to the door, you'd take a token and go in, have you, you'd bathe, and then when you go out, you'd put the card back. If you went to the door and there were no cards, you weren't allowed in. And so they were limiting work in progress because it's much more effective if you limit the amount of people in there. A similar thing happens now in Auckland in New Zealand on the motorways. Obviously, a 100% utilized motorway is not that good because everything's 0% flow. Everything slows up. And the optimal is around about 80%. So all of the on-ramps in New Zealand have traffic lights which automatically stop the cars going onto the motorway. So we continually have that flow. And that's something we need to think about in our resource management, that we think of a BA or a tester thinking, how much do they cost per year? We can't have them 80% utilized. But that's actually the sweet spot, 80%, for, uh, for, for the way people work. So what I've got here, this is a production line. And we've got four people here, four operators. And this happened in China. So uh, they're building headphones. And, and this lady here, she's uh, building the, the ear cups. So she's screwing up in the, in the ear cups. So she, she'll spend, I don't know, five minutes doing that. And then when she's finished, she'll put it into the staging post here. This person's putting in the, the speakers in the headphone. She'll solder them in. And so she'll pull the work. It's a pull system, not a push system. And she spends about three minutes on that. When she's finished, puts it there. And so on, this person does something else and all the way down here. Now, in manufacturing, Kanban is actually the inventory management. So you see these things up here. These are two bins. And the materials you use to assemble the parts go into bins. And the bins have the card system. And when one becomes empty, you flip the card over and move to the next bin, which is full. And then somebody from the warehouse will see it's empty and they'll fill it. So again, it's a pull system. And Toyota actually got this from the Americans and the supermarkets. You wouldn't buy a year's worth of lettuce and put it on the store because after about three days, it would be wasted. So this is the Kanban system here. But what we're interested in is the flow through here. So... Um, so let's say this person spends four minutes and that spend, person spends two minutes. So how long would it take for something to go through this production line and off to be shipped? It's eight, 12, 14 minutes, yeah? So after 14 minutes, the first piece of, the first headphones are boxed up and off they go. When will the next headphone arrive? Nine, what do you six reckon? Minutes? Six minutes? <coughs> two minutes? Any more? Actually, this number here, and it's called Theory of Constraints, Ellie Goldratt. Um, so you can Google this guy. He's got a book called The Goal. And what I used to do as a production engineer was continually look at what was the slowest item because this slow person here is who's going to hold up the, the, the rest. And what's going to happen here after this person has finished after three minutes, she's going to wait. And then she's going to, uh, so 
but then they'll take five minutes. This person will wait for one, and then this person will wait for three. And then you'll end up with buffers and voids. And because it's not a balanced line, you'll end up with people stopping. And what Toyota does, and what I, I used to do in, in China, is if you didn't have any work to do, you'd fold your arms. And you could see if there was a constraint in the production line, if somebody was breaking the parts or there's having defects and they were throwing them out, you would suddenly see that both sides of that constraint would start folding their arms, and within a few minutes, the whole production line would stop, which when you've got a few hundred people in a big long line, it's quite scary. So and that's why we would be focusing on the constraint, the slowest part. Why do we do this? Well, if this person after three minutes um, built some... Uh, built something else and put it here and then something else there and something else here, we're building up work in progress, which is bad because then this person, by the time they get to it, they're saying, well, that, that's defective, that's defective, and so are these. So the cost of defect goes up. So the rule is you only put your work into this box when it's... You only ever pull work from this box when you're able to, when you finish this work here. So it's a pull system, and that's really important. And we're focusing on end-to-end -end flow. And then we look at the cycle time. The cycle time is 14 minutes. But then the, the drop-off rate, the tack time, is five minutes. Tact is a German for the, uh, the metronome. So every five minutes, you'd see something drop off. And this actually would be a poor setup. So what I would do is get this person to be four minutes, and uh, this person to be four minutes, so balance them. And this person here, I'd say, well, can these two people do it? So it'd go four minutes, five and five, and I'd maybe, or, or the person beyond. So I'd, I'm continually trying to balance the line. And we're not worried about the people who have sat idle, because that's not the cost. This person sat idle for three minutes costs you nothing. This person who's taking five minutes and holding everybody else up, that's where the cost is. That's the constraint. So this is a mindset, and in, in manufacturing now, everything that's built is built with this. If it's not automated and it's using real people, they're always focusing on the constraint. So yeah, look into this guy, Ellie Goldratt. Uh, it's really interesting uh, stuff he's done. Do you have any questions on Kanban when it looks like that? Another person is talking about it being a constraint. Yeah. Um, what if that part just takes longer, needs more time just for quality purposes? Yeah. Uh, so that's a real challenge. So what you do is what can you take out of that process and add elsewhere? If, if I had a machine, like a heat treatment machine, actually I've got a really good example. So I used to work on these little GPS receivers and back in the day it would take 20 minutes for you to get a GPS fix. So we'd have to test it in 20 minutes but then the operators, I only had six operators, they would take five minutes apiece. And then I had a carousel so it would sit on the carousel for 15 minutes, so it would ro rotate round, and it would be sat doing nothing, but that constraint meant we would have four units in the test environment, so then we would still have that drop-off rate of five. Because if we only had one unit in the test environment, it would drop off every 15 minutes. So what you do, in, in essence, what I've done there is paralleled it up. But if you do have a constraint and there's no way around it, that's the piece that you ensure is never waiting. So if you have some machinery that's stamping or pressing or doing some test uh, running which takes time, you make sure that that never stops. So all the people around it are continually feeding it. And that's your constraint. The cost is de de defined by that. Um, but yeah, that's a constraint. There, there is a limit. D does that help? Yep. Yeah. Any other questions? Katie? You do see an analogy with decision making. So if you hold up at the beginning with um, like in an organization with hierarchical structure and the decision making at the top sort of trickling down. Do you see an analogy with that? Yeah, so in the, in the case of manufacturing, we're looking at physical, tangible artifacts moving through. In the knowledge world, in the conceptual work that you do, the flow is of knowledge, of ideas. And so that artifact of the decision is, is knowledge. And if the decision is holding you up, that's a constraint. And we'll move on in a minute to how you visualize that because if the business knows that having something on your entry for a week is meaning that the team sat idle for a week and you're paying 25 grand a week for this team, then that's very expensive to have that bit of paper on your desk. But you need to know about it. Having said that, in lean principles, there's a notion of deferring decisions as late as possible. So we want to try and make decisions as late as we can. But then when we need to make the decisions, we make them. We, we don't make decisions beyond when we could have. 
Yeah. I'm wondering if this manufacturing analogy is pushed a bit too far because in all the examples you can be given, every item coming off the line is unique. Uh, sorry, is, uh, is a copy of the previous items, whereas in software development we're always doing something new each time. Everything is new every time, that's, that's correct, but everything you do, you need to analyze, test, develop, code, check in, document, all of the stuff that you do, put in Git, check out, code branch. You still have a flow of work, so it's not the artifact that you keep the same. And, and you're actually right, so in the manufacturing world, you try and reduce variation and everything is exactly the same. You use Six Sigma to control variation. And what we try and do in Agile is exploit variation by doing lots of different things, running experiments and getting the feedback. So it's not the artifact that's always the same, but the flow of work is. So in your profession and the work you do, you have that continual flow, which is this next slide I've got up here now. You can see, for example, we've got to do, assess, develop, develop ready for test, test, and done. And you can see as well, I've got those numbers on each column and each one of these numbers is a WIP limit. So you'd work out who in your team, how many people you are on the team, and what is a reasonable work in progress limit. And there's some, some formula you can use, or you can just use rule of thumb, or you can keep tweaking it until you see a balance. So I've got here uh, six, four, five, and three. This is six items. So each one of these tickets is a piece of work. So what you do is work is continually flowing in, and you put it in the to-do column. You may have somebody who's continually uh, prioritizing to see what the next most important piece of work is. Again, it's a pull system, so you always, as a team, you focus on the thing at the end. So even if you're an analyst, you start looking, if, and you, you're available to do some work, you go to the items on the end column, is there anything I can do with these in test to get them to done? Because that's when we get the value, that's when we take it off the board. So we need to stop starting and start finishing, is, is the rule of thumb. It was really funny, by the way, I was consulting at um, Spark, which is a telco in, in New Zealand, and their tagline was, never stop starting. <laughs> but yeah, it's marketing, right? Um, so, so you see here the done column is, is empty, and the test column is full. So, and the ready for test is almost full as well. So if you're a developer, and let's say, let's just edit this here. Uh, I've got my little ticket here. Oops. I've got my ticket here and it's ready to go into ready for test. I finish my work. Then these people can't put anything else in ready for test. So what they need to do is try and find out how they can help the test people take this away here. If this assess column here is full, yeah, if this assess column here is full, then they can't pull in any here. And this is a rule and you follow it religiously. Just in the same way with Scrum, you use the time box as a non-negotiable boundary. Work in progress is a boundary here. Now, comparing to Scrum, remember we talked about definition of done and definition of ready, and there are a clear common understanding of the boundary between one state and the next. Here, we don't have that, but what we have on each one of these lines is a policy, and it's a common ag agreement in each case, what it means from something to go from assess to development. So what happens, you're a, a developer, this column's full, ready for test is full and test is full. What do you do? Yeah. Uh, if you can't help the testers, what do you do? If the testers say, I'm, I'm onto it, it's just winning the test, we just got to sit and watch it. What, what, what do you do then? You, you're going to love this online. Um, well, you say, uh, do you want a coffee? <laughs> exactly right. Yeah, you, so you, you try and uh, support these people because we try and empty the columns on the right every time. The to-do column here, uh, like I say, so go, going uh, briefly into visualization, what may happen is you may have a product owner who says, hey, uh, this has just come up. It's a production failure. Sorry, let's color it in red. That didn't work, did it? There you go, that one there and put a star in it, and that then maybe you have a special lane. This is playing around with a system, and you may have a whip limit for that lane that you can take one item that goes through and breaches the rules. It's like a clearway. Like in the um, former Soviet Union, there's the zill lanes for all of the government cars to go through. So you could have that as a zill lane. 
So that's something that we sometimes do. I've seen people say, well, it's in test and we've got a development issue, so we're going to push it back through to development. Um, I've got mixed feelings about that. You want to see the flow move left to right. I would just hold it in test until you fix all the defects and then it passes through to done. That's the correct thing to do. But some teams say, no, we'll push it back. The thing about this now is you've got the flow and you're limiting work in progress, but what you see here is visualization of work. And it becomes blatantly obvious if you've got lots and lots of boxes in dev. And we know, is there any developers here? Any coders? So, <laughs> don't take this personally. Um, yeah, the testers, they're, they're getting on with the testing, so I've got this really cool stuff I can do here. And this is the rule of thumb of what happens if you don't explicitly have the whip limit, is you have a buildup of work here. And then the testers are going off, crying out loud, and it starts to load them here, and it slows them down to nothing. Think about the Auckland Harbour Bridge. Everyone, it's, it's Christmas holidays, it's going to be a nightmare when I fly back tomorrow. And everybody's going to try and go north of Auckland, and everything's going to be stationary. So we want to focus on flow and keep people at a sustainable pace. So just crank back, gas back a little bit on the load. And we do that by visualizing the work. So as a stakeholder, if you see a, a Kanban board with loads and loads of tickets, especially if they're parked, so you might have a column here for parked. Who, who's asking about external? Um, somebody was asking about, no, it was actually a different meeting, sorry. <laughs> um, if you have a, an external stakeholder where you have to pass over a card and wait for them to sign it off or approve it or a decision to be made and that's holding you up here, you could potentially have awaiting decisions. Now one good thing to do is you could perhaps have them all here in a big parking lot. The problem there is you're just creating whip, you're creating uh, potential for defects costs to go up. So the best thing to do is stop the team and allow the stakeholder to know that we can't do anything else until you clear this backlog for us. And that takes some courage and culturally the whole organization needs to understand why you're doing this and why it impacts the team because having too much work in the system is very, very costly. Do we have any questions so far while I quickly go on to the next page? Yeah, all good? And anything from Skype? No? So, yeah. Um, sorry. Uh, right, so a question. Um, can you use a combination of Kanban and Scrum within an Agile project? Uh -huh. I could have paid somebody to ask that. That's a brilliant question. Yes, you can. Here's a scrum board. It looks very similar to a Kanban board. So we have the sprint backlog here. These are the user stories that the team pulled in. We have a to-do, in progress, and done. I took this picture back in February, and I suspect that was close to the sprint review, and maybe they, that story was done, that was not done, this was, and then there was a few things on the bottom that they were doing. What I tend to do, so Scrum doesn't tell you you need to do a Scrum board. It, it just says that the team needs to plan the work and visualize it and plan the progress and be able to be transparent to the stakeholders of what's progressing during the sprint. So you can, technically, you can use a Gantt chart for a sprint if you really, really want to. I'm not suggesting it, but you can do that. So Scrum sort of uses a Kanban board. So you see this flow of to do, in progress, and done. There isn't a whip limit here because we're limited by, working, uh, by the time, the time box. So this sprint would be two weeks long. And we know that these three stories we aim to finish by the end of the sprint. So this is a very stock standard. First team, first sprint, this is how it would look. Um, but beyond that, there's other things that I would add. The first is a burn down chart. The second are avatars. And then the third are impediments and parking lots. So I will go through each one individually, um, but before I do that, the, in answer to the question on Kanban, Kanban is really good if you're doing BAU work or it's interrupt driven. So if you, if you have a team who are taking in uh, requests, IT requests on a continual basis, 
it's great for on every day you can prioritize what the next piece of work is that you're going to pull in. And so it's really good that the, each one of those tickets you want to be about a day long or a couple of days long. Scrum, on the other hand, what happens is you pull these three user stories in at the beginning of the sprint, and then if anything comes to you during those two weeks of the sprint, you say, thanks, let's talk to the product owner about it, maybe it'll go into the next sprint. So the best you can do is maybe on average a week, and that delay may not be tolerable for defects. So um, the blend of the two, which can be called scrum ban, but this is the way I often work with teams, is that they will commit half of the time, or maybe 80% of the time, to Scrum, and they will pull user stories in, but then they'll have 20% of the time where they have ad hoc work uh, going through in the flow basis, the interrupt-based um, work, so they have a Scrum board and a Kanban board, or even one board with both. And in their daily stand-up, they would first talk about what they've done to achieve the sprint goal and any work that they visualized here. The, the mantra that I give to all teams is if it's not on the board, it doesn't exist, we don't do it. So everything that we do gets captured here for transparency. And this is a visualization again. Uh, do you think that answers the question? Yeah. Okay, so let's go back to my um, outrage. So, uh, burn down charts. Here is a sprint burn down chart. So this is going back to Scrum now. You can have burn down charts and burn up charts with Kanban. And if you're using Jira, there's some really cool tools on there. So you can see if the work is being added faster than you're taking it away, you're gonna, the, the backlog is going to start building. So your responsiveness is going to slow down. So then over time, you can see these graphs uh, diverging and you can do something about it. So you, what you want to have is either parallel or tending towards completion. So you, if you see that more and more work has been added to the backlog and faster than you can take it away, that's a challenge. And this is why we measure the cycle time. And we, so we can, we can time stamp the work when it comes in and see how long it is until it's delivered. So that's a technique with, with Kanban. But for Scrum, we have what's known as a sprint burn down chart. And let's use a nice green color here. Now let's use red. So. Uh, there's two uh, axes on the left. Many people use story points. So each story will be attributed a relative sizing using the Fibonacci sequence of 1, 3, 5, 8, 13, 21. And they may use that for the burn down chart. And I know in Jira, that's how Jira uses it. The challenge I in practice have is most stories, most burn down charts start looking like this, which is no good at all because on day six, well, how well are we doing? That's not transparent at all. So typically what I do with teams is you have the user stories, but you have those, remember that second, that last picture I showed you, you had the big cards, which were the stories, and then you had the post-it notes, which were the tasks. So a story is maybe three days long, something like that, and the tasks would be around about half a day. What we want then is maybe this could be number of tasks, on average they're about the same size, or you could add a few hours to each task, estimate it's going to be a four-hour task or a six-hour task, add up the, the composite of all of the tasks and have every day how many hours we think are remaining. And then you can see a trend line going down. Now, if the trend line looks like this, that's a bad sign uh, because that means somebody's game in the system because it never looks like that. <laughs> um, what typically happens is you get started and you think, whoa, that four-hour task is a bit larger than we thought, and things spike up, and then we start trending down again, and then we have a problem, find another problem, and it goes down, and then we get close to the end, and this happens. So that, a burn-down chart may look like that, which is really fascinating, because in the retrospective, we can say, uh, hey, guys, what happened here? Uh, how did you feel there? And didn't that feel great there? So we can talk about the, the events. Also, if you use Scrum Ban, so this is just for the stories which are pulled in in Scrum, you may then have the team committing to 20% of the time on tickets. So they may, for example, agree with the business that 20% of the time is on support of existing products because we want the same people who develop the product to support it in, in production. And so maybe they have a... Maybe they have a ceiling uh, every sprint with 80 hours. We're going, to spend, we're going to allow 80 hours as an upper limit to work on supporting uh, existing products. And every day, how many hours did we spend on them? Now, you can capture this, these, this, this in uh, Jira. 
Uh, or if you've got a co-located team and you're just using whiteboards, you can just on the daily stand-up say how many hours yesterday, two, three, five, that's another nine. And you can see this trending up like this. So that's unplanned work. Um, if you've got this happening, you know early on that you've got a problem. Now it could be that it's reasonable because there's loads of several defects that you're trying to address. Or this could be lots of senior managers tapping the team on the shoulders asking them to do some really important stuff without the understanding of this project sponsor who's paying for them at the time. So this is a good visualization technique to say, we think we're going to fail a sprint because the team keep getting sidetracked and the context switching. So um, quite often I've used that to give guidance and redirective feedback and soft coaching to some of the senior managers. That's, that's really powerful. So that's the sprint burn down chart. So on my scrum board, I'll have the to-do in progress done, and then I'll have a, just a, an A3 sheet of paper, and every day the team will update the, the daily scrum. In fact, there was one team, uh, they, the, the business bought them pizza at sprint planning at the following sprint, if they had a successful sprint. That was part of the fun, because you know sprint planning, iteration planning is four hours long, and we would shout at Hell's Pizza or, or Domino's or something to get delivered. So they called this here, this here they called the pizza delta. And every day they said, how big is our pizza delta? The difference between getting pizza and not. So they were always very well motivated to try and pull this in. We live in an uncertain world. So the, the plan itself is real. The planning is useful, but the plan itself is useless because we, there's things we don't know until we get going. And as we ex experience with that coin game, you, when, you, when you plan something, you don't know what it is until you see some empirical feedback. So we want to just get going as soon as possible. So that's what a sprint burn down chart looks like. Is there anyone got any questions while I flip over? Um, yeah, I do, Katie, again. Uh, just that you're equating the story points with time, and I thought story points were an estimate of complexity of the task and not yeah. a time-based estimate. Point. So, yeah, that's a really good point. Um, and if people say, I, another team a few months ago, this, I said, how have you worked out the story points? They said, well, each story point is one man equivalent of a day or something. And they directly correlated them. What I do is we do the estimating of the stories, and we say these are five, these are eight, and so on. At the end, we say, well, that's a, uh, we think we can pull in 40 points on average. Then what I can also do is ask for the capacity of the team. So if there's six people, um, uh, six people with 10 days times eight is four, 480 hours, isn't it? But I wouldn't expect this number to be 480. But what we would say is last sprint we had six people on the team. This sprint one guy's off for three days and somebody might be sick or whatever. So then what we do is just say roughly we're about 80%. I don't relate hours to user stories because that's really dangerous because we want to use relative, not absolute values. But what we can do is when we task it out, if each story has a few hours on it, what we think it's a four hour or five hour task, when we put it on the sprint backlog, I can say, well, hold on a minute, this eight here you've got at 50 hours, but then this five that we thought was a five, you've only got 12 hours or you've got 100 hours. Do you still think these are an eight or a five? And the team will go, ah, yeah we've forgotten a few tickets on one of them, or no, maybe it's larger. But then we, we're not holding, the, so this is for the team to self-plan. And a team of six, this number here would be about 200. Now, if the business saw a team of six uh, uh, doing 200 hours in two weeks, there'd be words to be had. It's not the absolute hours, it's a general feeling. So don't see them as uh, absolute figures. Uh, but that's a good point. Don't ever try and uh, align hours to points. It's just I generally find it's a lot more transparent to have this curve than that. And that's a typical pattern for the story points. Okay, so we're going to quickly go to, because we've only got a few minutes left, we're going to go to the um, product backlog. View uh, gallery. Uh, which is this one here. So you're the product owner now. And in every iteration we are going to uh, do some great work. Uh, in the first one, there you go, we had 30 points. The next one was only 25. Uh, then we did 35. And you can see over time we get variation. What we can do over time is work out the, 
I don't believe I'm in the Bureau of Statistics telling you how to work out the mean. But you know what I'm saying, right? <laughs> what we want to do is this backlog here is uh, the items at the top have the highest business value. And, sorry, close that down. As we progress down, we'll have a degradation over time. Um, of, say this was a thousand points. Over time, every sprint, we're losing 35, 20, 25, and 30. And we can have a best case and a worst case. And this is called a cone of uncertainty. So what we can do is go to the stakeholders and say, based on the last three sprints and the average of what our velocity tended to be, and we've done a very broad brushstroke of what the whole product backlog looks like. We think it's 1,000 points. We think we can finish the whole thing in however many sprints. At best, if we go at the fastest pace this date here, at worst, it's going to be somewhere around here. And then we can have a conversation with the stakeholders. And I've used this in a bank to C-level people. I've not used any voodoo or PowerPoints. I've just used a whiteboard. And I said, look at these cards here. These we haven't done anything to. The question is, do you really need them? And the answer is obviously no, because this is a hard deadline. We need to be live before Christmas. We need this product before Christmas. So it's a lot easier to go to a stakeholder with this empirical data and visualizing the, the way the work is flowing this way. We can also say, well, by this date, what are we likely to have? Well, uh, on average, it's going to be somewhere around here. I'm pretty certain we're going to do this. We're definitely certain we can't do that. And you know what? Maybe we can do this here. So we're visualizing the work. And so the, the product owner can use this as a tool. There are some online tools you can use, and I think Jira can help uh, predict the future. And what we're trying to do here is uh, use historical data to predict the future. In the past, in sequential project planning, we would uh, use statistical process control. Here we're using empirical process control. And that being said, it's 1.29, and being the scrum police pullover, um, I wouldn't want to breach the hour-long limit. Is there any final questions? Uh, one last uh, slide I've got while we think about those questions. Where is it? There. I didn't mention avatars. On every ticket, I put people's faces, or they may use Simpsons characters or Toy Story characters, and that way you can visualize who is working on which ticket. So we've got avatars. We can visualize the flow and the progress, and we can put times. And if a ticket is stuck in one column, you, you can dot it every day. And if you see one ticket with loads of dots, you know you've got a problem and it's stuck in that column. You can have priority, so you can put a star on a particular ticket if you want that to take priority over others. Uh, you time stamp it, and of course, you want to visualize when work is done and get, to get that sense of achievement when you've finished the work. And on that note, I am done. Thanks Thank very you. much, Gareth. So please join me in thanking Gareth. <laughs> Great presentation, particularly I like the coin game. And um, I said to you, one of my personal crusades is I guess talking about team performance rather than individual performance. So some real good ammunition from the work there, Gareth, around focusing the team flow rather than the individual flow and things. So thank you very much. And I hope you've found that session very useful. If you have any questions after it, please come and speak to you know, Juliet or Daniel or John or one of the members of the team there. But thanks. Um, Gareth, thanks, Harry, for your help as well. So another round of applause for Gareth, please. Thank you. And I'd just like to say I'm here for the next day and a half. I've got a few meetings with teams. I'm doing one-on-one -on -one coaching with some of the Scrum Masters. But if you see me, I am available. Um, I can talk about this all day long, as you can tell. Uh, so I, I'm genuinely open for anyone to have a conversation with me. So I'll hang around here for the next half hour if you're interested. Thank you.